Uh, so our, our next presentation uh, is by uh, Nelson Ng, uh, who um, has come all the way uh, from Shanghai to be with us today. Um, you might be able to tell, like, this is the first time I've had a travel budget to play with. Um, so I got very excited at the idea we could bring someone all the way from China to speak about that. But I mean, I'm, I'm normally limited by, like, kind of, you know, a train ride or something. Um, the, the, the thing I really love about Lost Magazine is it's a, a travel magazine from China, but it's absolutely not a Chinese travel mag. It just happens to be made there. And the way that um, he has treated the, the Mandarin and the English and the way that the layouts present both languages together really sort of makes you feel like this is a magazine that is absolutely for the domestic Chinese readership, but also absolutely for the international English readership. Um, so uh, Nelson, come up and tell us all about it. Uh, thank you, Steve, and the organizers of QVET for inviting me here. Um, my name is Nelson, uh, and I run an independent magazine on travel based in Shanghai, China. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about how I came to make the magazine and uh, the, some of the things that I've learned from it. Um, and in the spirit of the magazine, I'm going to first start with a personal travel story uh, called The Meaning of Travel. It's quite a big statement, but... <laughs> Um, so this is a, a childhood photo of mine. Uh, I'm the kid on the right. Uh, this was taken in the island of Sentosa. Uh, so I was born in Singapore, and that's where I grew up. Uh, and growing up, growing up in a traditional, um, a typical uh, Chinese Asian family, uh, travel usually meant uh, <coughs> lots of physical activities. Uh, by that I meant like <coughs> going on rides, uh, going to the beach, staying in a holiday resort, um, going shopping. Uh, checking out famous tourist sites, or if there were a lot of people, you usually you join uh, a tour group uh, with a, on a tour bus uh, with a tour guide, and they will put you in a fancy hotel and wake you up at five or six in the morning <clears throat> and try to hit as many tourist sites as possible in one day. Um, yeah, it's, it's crazy and it's pretty stressful actually sometimes. Um, so that's, that was, that's kind of the typical Asian uh, travel, I mean, notion of travel. And so growing up, I actually wasn't really very interested in travel. In 2004, uh, I moved to uh, New York City uh, for art school. And uh, this was my first time living abroad. And when I came here, I had a culture shock. And um, I was suddenly exposed to lots of new, different cultures and people. Um, you know, the subway was really old and it broke down most of the time. Uh, I lived in, and then I lived in Brooklyn, uh, and to get a bowl of Chinese noodles, I had to take one hour on the subway uh, to Chinatown. And uh, it just made me realize how uh, Chinese I was, uh, even though I spoke and wrote English my whole life in Singapore. In 2008, uh, I moved to uh, Shanghai, China for work. And uh, just when I thought I knew everything about the world in New York, um, I had to relearn everything again uh, because the rules are different here. You know, people hung their clothes on trees. Uh, you, Google didn't work. Uh, suddenly, the subway was really uh, new and, and fast, but it was really crowded. And uh, now I could get Chinese noodles everywhere. And, but, but suddenly, now that I can get that, uh, I, I craved a, like a decent sandwich or a juicy burrito. And, and then I suddenly realized maybe I wasn't that Chinese after all. So it's weird things in life. Um, so up to that point, uh, I still wasn't really interested in travel. Uh, it, it wasn't until 2011 where I took a ship uh, to, from Shanghai to Japan. And uh, I had to... I had to take a ship because uh, I, uh, I was still working at the time, and I had to clear some overdue leave. And at the last minute to book a trip to Japan, uh, the cheapest option was to take a, a ship because uh, it's the same price the, the, uh, the whole year. So uh, you can book it tomorrow, and it's the same price. So I took this ship, uh, which was a kind of a, a semi-cargo ship. Uh, the bottom is they, they store uh, cargo, and the top they ferry passengers. Uh, and it takes about 48 hours to get from Shanghai to uh, Kobe. Um, so this is the ship, and uh, it's, this is the deck where you sit most of the time to, to look at the sea. 
Um, and this is where I slept. Uh, it's eight bits to a room, and, but it was really empty. It was like two people to a whole room. And, this is the, and so the, the, there really isn't much uh, to do on the ship, actually. Uh, this is the deck where, where I was most of the time. Um, most, most of the people on the ship were either reading or talking to each other or just staring at the sea. And this is the, the view that you will be looking at all the time. Um, and when you're staring at the sea for long hours, uh, you can't help but think like how in, insignificantly small we, we all are. You know, we're kind of just like uh, a drop in the ocean, you know? I mean, some bigger than others, but it's still a drop. Uh, and, and, you know, the world is really big. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't realize how important this was until later on. Um, not that we're small, but how the environment that you're in and the, the scenery that you're looking at can, can affect you internally, uh, your thoughts directly. And, and it was at this point where I sort of came to the a revela revelation that <clears throat> that travel isn't actually a, a physical activity. Uh, it's actually an exploration into our inner landscapes. And um, you know, it didn't matter whether I was going to famous sites or, or going to the beach or going on rides. Uh, I, I realized what was important was for the environment and the place that I was going to, to connect with me to inspire something inside me, like inspire something that I never thought before. Um, and I thought that that was perhaps the true and valuable meaning of, of travel. And uh, for the rest of my trip in, in Japan, uh, you know, uh, it was completely opposite of how I understood travel when I was young. Uh, I couldn't speak the language, um, so I couldn't talk to people really. Uh, I, I didn't know where to go, I got lost all the time, um, so I kept asking for directions. People drew me hand-drawn maps, and you know, I wasn't staying in a fancy hotel, so <clears throat> it, was, it was actually quite an uncomfortable trip. Um, but by the time I got back uh, to China, uh, I realized I had grown so much internally and, and learned so much from the trip. Uh, and then I started to realize, like, hey, this kind of feels like when I moved to uh, New York and, and in Shanghai. And, and I realized, actually, I had been traveling all along, and I had been traveling every day. Um, and I came to the conclusion that travel isn't about going to a place. It's actually about reaching a state of mind. And uh, what it means is, I feel, is uh, it's, it's having a feeling like being provoked by this place. Uh, and you could even feel this crossing the street or going to a friend's place, as long as uh, it, it excites you and it does something for you. And I feel that that's, that, that's what travel actually really means. Um, and so, uh, I wanted to, so I wanted to share what I learned about um, travel. And uh, I wanted to also hear from other people what their thoughts on travel was. So um, I decided to make a magazine called Lost. And it's based on this feeling that uh, I got from my trip in Japan. And I wrote something to describe it. So the feeling of lost is wonderful because you can find yourself again. It's almost like starting from scratch, resetting the palette, soul searching, learning a new perspective, acquiring fresh ingredients for life, forgetting who you were, forging a new self, and then getting lost again. So using this, um, I started approaching friends to uh, ask them to contribute their travel stories. Um, but one very key important point is uh, I wanted them to contribute personal travel stories, because uh, most people, they're used to writing the physical activities of travel. Uh, like, they are used to recommending, like, oh, you should get, check out this famous museum or statue, or you should eat at this restaurant, or, you know, go to this beach. But I, I told them, uh, this is not what I wanted. Um, I want you to tell me your reflections and your feelings and your traveling, uh, and all the weird accidents that happened during the trip. Uh, and, to, and for me, um, only when travel uh, affects you personally, then it becomes valuable. Uh, so it, it took a while to sort of change this perception for some of the writers. And I'm going to share some of the stories that came with issue one. Um, and so, like, uh, this was Wing. Uh, she went to Nepal, and uh, on the first, she did all this research on, on, on Nepal, and on the first day of a trip, she just threw her, her map into the trash because uh, she realized that nothing, it doesn't even fit, and, and it's so chaotic that she kind of just freestyled her, her travel the rest of the, the trip. Uh, 
this was Tori, uh, he wrote about how he went to Egypt <clears throat> during, the state, during a state of emergency, uh, and he, he wrote about how he, he, he felt fear during the whole time because he, couldn't, he didn't meet a single tourist his entire trip um, in Egypt. Uh, Crystal, she, she wrote about um, how uh, f foreign languages are not a barrier to communication, uh, but actually the, the fear of trying to communicate actually stops you from, from making new friends. And, and, and she kind of describes this you know, by talking about how uh, her, when her translator friend is around, she kind of feels mute. Um, and uh, a, a really lovely quote from her was this, um, if you didn't interact with strangers along the way, what you see is only the scenic spots in a tourist guidebook. The things that make a trip memorable are always the people, events, and content. So it's great, because I, I actually learned a lot from my contributors as well. Um, Winnie, uh, she spent two months in uh, Yunnan, China. It's, it's a southern uh, province in China. And she wrote about uh, three different people she met along the way, and uh, how their personalities changed her view on life. Um, Kevin Lunsong, uh, he, uh, he, he used hiking in the mountains as a way to unleash uh, his emotions. And uh, he, created his, uh, he merged his words with his photographs to create a series of uh, typographic visual poetry, which I, I, thought, which I thought were really nice. And then there's Driv, uh, a graphic designer from Malaysia who uh, went to Nagano in Japan uh, and met a, a local designer who changed his perception on graphic design, on how uh, you know, it doesn't have, always have to be about big global brands, but it can also be used to help small local businesses. And uh, since then, he's gone back to Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia to start his own graphic design firm. And, and so I got all these um, submissions. Uh, and one of the problems was actually that they came in different languages because they were all, you know, not all of them were Chinese. So <clears throat> there was English and Chinese. And uh, at first it was a problem because it kind of made the magazine twice as thick. Uh, but eventually I decided to go with two languages because I wanted to keep the purity of some of the writing. So this was a big challenge in a sense. And one of the, okay, one of the things that uh, usually uh, designers do when, 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 when they have to do bilingual design is that they, they give it equal weight. Like, they try to match one language to the other. And uh, I mean, I did that a little quite a, on quite a few spreads as well in the magazine. But one of the biggest problems of Chinese versus English uh, the, is that um, the shapes are different. And um, Chinese letter forms are square in shape, but Roman letter forms are rectangular. And, you know, even the number of words will be different. And, you know, uh, Chinese characters have more strokes. So uh, no matter how you try, uh, they will never be completely equal and the same. So, I mean, initially I did that for quite a few spreads, and I still do that, which is fine. Um, but if you try to do that too much, uh, you kind of run into this trap of trying to make them equal. And so uh, later on on some spreads, uh, I try to separate them a little bit, so where the Chinese can exist on its own and the English on its own. So these are the two of the same content. Um, you know, and then later on, like, I, be, I, I played with the design according to the differences, um, how, you know, this is the English text and then this is the Chinese text. Like, I made them as different as possible, because uh, so it's kind of like, think of it as uh, a band, right? You have two lead instruments. One is an electric guitar and one is an electric keyboard. And like, you don't want to play the same thing all the time. Like sometimes you want one instrument to get out of the way so that one guy can solo. Uh, and sometimes you, they play together. And, and if you really need two languages on a page, you, you, you try to make them complement each other. So like on this page, like the, the Chinese is way smaller on, than the English. Or like this page. Um, like, I try to uh, push it in terms of their differences and make them work. So, like, even the body of text, like, they're completely not equal. And I play with the differences. So, this, like, on this page, like, they are the same, but uh, I don't make them the same shape, so to make it more dynamic. And then for this story, uh, I completely just had fun with the positioning and the shapes of the Chinese and English text. And, and the, the cool thing about Chinese text is that you can design it vertically or horizontally, so you, you kind of have an option to uh, play around with it. Um, 
So uh, on distribution and meeting people. Uh, so I'm actually really new to uh, magazines. <laughs> and uh, so I, you know, when I made this magazine, I printed it on Impulse. I had uh, like no shops stocking this magazine when I printed it, <laughs> which was really silly, but it happened. Um, so, I, you ha so I have this beautiful printed object. And um, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I was like, oh, cool, I'm going to meet all these distributors uh, everywhere, and, and, and they're going to stock my magazine, and I'm going to be famous, and in all the major bookstores. And then uh, on the day before I went out to meet the distrib distributors, I, I saw this statement online that no one cares about your magazine, which is really true. Um, and I met with a lot of distributors, uh, some distributors in Singapore, and um, they've never heard about my magazine, and uh, they, the, 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 the reaction wasn't very positive, because uh, They've never heard about it. It's, it's very thick. It's very expensive because it's, it's a small print run, and uh, they were not, you know, they were not willing to stock it. Um, so, um, so what I did after that was I actually uh, approached. I went back to Shanghai and I went to the shops that I liked, um, and I brought, I carried the magazines by hand, one by one, to the shops um, to and um, to stock my magazines at places that don't usually stock magazines actually, and. This actually turned out to be a good thing because um, for two reasons. Uh, one is that I actually got to build personal relationships with independent stores around the world, not just China. And two, uh, I got to be a part of the independent scene. And um, what this means, uh, okay, I'll, I'll share. So following this, I'm going to share like some of the inspiring connections that I've made through this process. So for example, like uh, I've stocked the magazine in a lot of cafes in China. And uh, this is the Moon Coffee uh, in Shanghai. And they're an independent uh, coffee shop. And because of this, um, it's, run, well, it's run by Xiao Feng, who's an uh, architect turned barrister. And because of this, the magazine started to be associated with independent coffee culture in China. Um, I stopped at that books actually in Singapore, which is an independent bookshop. In, in Singapore, and this is Kenny, who runs Books Actually, and he's a he's a leading figure in in the Singapore independent publishing scene. Uh, he has his own publishing label as well called Math Paper Press, and uh, coincidentally, he also organizes the Singapore Art Book Fair. And through the relationship of stocking at a store, I got to be a part of the Singapore Art Book Fair as well. Um, this is No Morning Independent Bookstore in Chengdu. Uh, run by a girl called Rosa. And this was one of the most important shops in China, actually, because a few years back, there was no way to get independent magazines. And she was the only store where you could get like magazines such as Serial or The Gentle Woman. So it's a really important store, actually. And she, <clears throat> over the last few years, she's been getting a lot of press about her store as well. And through our relationship uh, to stocking at her store, like the magazine got a lot of press as well. Oh, and she also creates her own um, risograph publications. Uh, I also stocked the magazine at uh, Triple Major, which is a fashion store in, in Shanghai. Uh, so it's run by a guy called Richie, and you know they, he, he sells art objects uh, and uh, avant-garde uh, Chinese fashion, and also uh, independent magazines and books. So it was, it was cool to, be, to, to stock there because uh, I got to associate my magazine with the fashion industry. Uh, this is uh, Guo or Guolo in Chinese. Uh, it's a fruit juice shop and, uh, uh, in Shanghai. Um, and they also sell publications, uh, you know, and they do interesting exhibitions such as uh, using the fruit, fruit pulp to dye cloth. Um, and through our relationship and stocking lost, uh, I ended up collaborating with them to make a little zine as well, where we talk about bringing uh, farming life to the city. Um, uh, I was also part of the, uh, Lost was also part of the Hangzhou Art Book Fair last year. Uh, it was quite impressive because uh, this was the, kind of what the book fair looked like. Uh, and they featured a lot of local Chinese zines. Uh, a lot of which I, even I don't know, <laughs> but they look really interesting. And they are run, uh, it was organized by three girls. We were, we we're kind of like a three girl band based in Hangzhou uh, called Dreamer. And they, they run like printmaking workshops and they publish their own little zines. Um, so, yeah, this, I mean, 
there's a lot going on in China, actually. <laughs> this is just a selection of some of the stuff. Um, and then Occupy Library, uh, I, <clears throat> I stalked with them in Taiwan, in, Taichung, in the city of Taichung. And they're an interesting group of people, a uh, mix of designers and architects. So what they do is they, they go to different parts of Taichung, and they, uh, they use old spaces, and they remake them into reading spaces. Uh, into libraries, uh, so it was very interesting to stalk with them because they are kind of like pushing for, um, you know, changing the city and, and making people be aware of Taichung, and, and and you know this is kind of like the kind of libraries that they create from the old spaces, which features a lot of good by uh, Chinese and Western uh, zines and books, and they also publish their own books. Uh, this is one a uh, recent book that they published called We Are in Community. Uh, it's about community spaces from Tokyo to Taiwan. You should definitely check them out. They're really interesting. Uh, and last but not least, uh, I also stocked the magazine at uh, a hostel in Tainan, in, in Taiwan as well. Um, and what better place than to stock a travel magazine in a hostel? Um, and through this, I got associated as well with a wave of new independent hostels that is coming up in China and Taiwan as well. Um, done by really young architects. Um, I mean, this architect is around my age, and he's really young, and, and he, he, he uses like old buildings and makes them into uh, a really nice hostel for young people. And yeah, so um, I mean, through, it, was, it, was, it was great that, um, that I actually didn't get into distributors right in the beginning, and I got the chance to meet a lot of um, independent stores. Um, and, and that really changed the, the dynamic and how people saw Lost in China, especially. Um, and, and a final word is um, uh, one of the things that was really uh, meaningful and gratifying was uh, when we received some emails from our readers saying, thanking us for making them excited about travel again. And I think regardless of how Lost uh, grows and develops, I think, uh, you know, at the core of what we do, we'll, we'll always be trying to make people fall in love with travel. Um, thank you.